Welcome to ADB Insight. I'm Nisha Pillay. In this episode, how to finance the future of the Asia-Pacific region. The global pandemic has left many governments facing a financial double whammy. Unprecedented spending, together with lower tax revenues, has left a great chasm which somehow has to be bridged. Many governments are walking an economic tightrope in order to do so. Since COVID surfaced nearly two years ago, public spending has skyrocketed from providing healthcare and vaccines to supporting businesses and indeed entire sectors like travel and tourism, which have been decimated. That's put more strain on public finances, already under pressure from renewable energy commitments and other urgent development priorities. The challenge is to find additional tax revenues while addressing inefficiencies without threatening the equitable economic recoveries that governments in the region are currently trying to stimulate. It's an area that the ADB has been working hard to reform. So-called domestic resource mobilization or DRM has become a key priority for the bank that helps the region to grow and recover out of the global pandemic. To tell us more, I'm delighted to be joined by Bruno Carrasco, Director General of ADB Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department. Bruno, welcome to ADB Insight. Now, first off, I'd like to ask you, what do you see as the most pressing problems in terms of DRM, domestic resource mobilization, that developing countries in the Asia Pacific region currently face? Thank you very much for that question, Nisha. Um, we have seen that uh, as a result of the pandemic, we have had economies that have slowed down in terms of their growth rates. Uh, we have seen a lot of stimulus measures that have been introduced, including stimulus by way of reductions in, in, in tax measures, including such things as tax deferrals, including such things as tax waivers, reduction in some tax rates. So this comes against the background of um, a relatively weak revenue collection across Asia Pacific prior to the pandemic. But at the same time, spending was going up through the counter cyclical support measures. So all of this has put in much greater pressures on public finances. And we have to find a solution to be able to strengthen re revenue collection at the same time as supporting the economic recovery. You say we need to find a solution to this conundrum. So what measures might help in the, in the short term, but also in the longer term? We need to make sure that tax policy follows what is generally known as the three T principles. So the first T is, is timely. So the uh, tax policy measures need to be introduced in a timely manner. They need to be temporary, and we need to be careful that we don't keep these uh, tax uh, policy measures in place, these incentives too long. And finally, they need to be well targeted uh, so that they are more effective. Now, in terms of what we've seen across these economies is that there were a lot of differences uh, across the sectors in terms of how they were affected by the pandemic. So we've had a number of uh, businesses that went bust and they basically had to file for bankruptcy. So that tax collection that was generated from those businesses has been wiped out. Many companies have gone into the informal sector precisely to uh, uh, avoid having to pay those, those taxes that they were simply unable to do so. Those small enterprises, even micro, sometimes even cottage type industries. And there's another uh, area that is uh, worth recognizing, and that would be sectors that have been also severely hit. And we think here of such things as the tourism sector, across many of the Southeast Asian economies, for example. We also have the transport sector. These have been hit also quite heavily. And finally, there are sectors that have done actually quite well during this uh, pandemic. Uh, here we could highlight such things as the digital economy, uh, e-commerce. So here we're actually maybe generating a lot more revenues than we were in the past. So whenever we look at what we refer to as removal of that stimulus, bringing in tax measures to help strengthen these economies, we need to look at uh, the differentiated approaches across these sectors. Yes, that seems to be a sensible approach, but I imagine there's pressure on governments to raise taxes across the board. Now, you seem to be saying that could be counterproductive. 
So it's it's all about calibration and doing it uh, very effectively. We have to bear in mind that throughout this process, uh, there is a lot of strong interest uh, among business communities to start investing. So we need to make sure that that tax policy continues to be business friendly. And one other thing that is really important here, we need to make sure that directly or indirectly that tax policy can lead to uh, better equity uh, in the economy. So these are some of the examples uh, of how um, the, the pandemic affects uh, the, the economy and how tax policy in some ways has to respond to uh, those factors. There's also been a lot of talk about improving cross-border tax cooperation where all governments win rather than them competing against each other. But in the past, that kind of cooperation has been pretty hard to pull off, hasn't it? Indeed, Nisha. What we have traditionally seen uh, across countries uh, has been that uh, tax policy was really considered um, uh, as uh, an important sovereign uh, matter. Um, and, and the traditional view was that uh, the more countries defer to international tax agreements, um, the more you lost control of that sovereign um, consideration. Now, that unfortunately is a false narrative. Um, in fact, we have seen in the context of, uh, of the crisis and looking back a few years before that um, there has been a perception of uh, countries racing to the bottom in terms of uh, providing uh, uh, tax incentives uh, to attract businesses uh, across the globe. And that uh, unfortunately has led to what is often referred to as, as a tax competition, which we all largely lose out on. So the idea is that uh, over the last few weeks, there has been an increasingly well appreciated uh, OECD led agreement on tax cooperation in the context of looking at how um, companies should be paying a certain amount of, of, of minimum taxes. So uh, that agreement uh, has resulted in uh, a minimum of a 15% corporate tax on the larger multinational companies. And that is expected to generate approximately $150 billion annually across the global economy as a result of that measure. We still have a lot of work to be done. So in the context of uh, Asia and the Pacific, um, only 20 of the 46 uh, countries, Asian development countries, have actually uh, signed up to the base erosion and profit shifting integrated framework. So lots to be done, as you say. But what is ADB doing specifically to promote the kind of cross-border cooperation you're talking about? So back in May, President Asakawa launched uh, the Asia Pacific Tax Hub. Uh, the Tax Hub really represents an important stepping stone towards having a collaborative, inclusive platform uh, where we can work closely with our developing member countries in Asia Pacific, but also with our development partners, including OECD, IMF, World Bank, the United Nations, and with our collective expertise we can help countries in terms of addressing many of these challenges that we've been discussing. Uh, and we generally work in the context of three pillars. One would be the medium-term revenue strategy. So it has to do with how we build a medium-term planning of, of how we recover revenue. It looks also as a second pillar to how we automate the tax administration, where again, there can be a lot of gains by automating uh, tax administrations. And thirdly, what I was just referring to about how we can better integrate countries to into those international tax cooperation agreements. Well, the tax hub certainly sounds like a bold and worthwhile initiative, and let's hope that you get buy-in from governments across the region. Bruno Carrasco, thanks so much for joining us on ADB Insight. Thank you, Nisha. It was a pleasure to talk to you. And thank you to everyone for joining us on this edition. From me, Nisha Pillay, goodbye for now.